Hello, everyone. This is your host, Susan Rosen. And today, my guest is Dr. Nathan Price. And Dr. Price, I, oh, I'm going to call you Nathan. I hope you don't mind. Um, Who's that? <laughs> and he is the chief scientific officer of Thorn Health, which he will tell us about. And he's uh, written a new book, it looks like. And he has some very good, um, oh, getting a blank mind again. Okay. Um, <laughs> where he went to school and those kinds of things. I just totally lost it. Um, at University of California, San Diego. Yep. And then Brigham Young. And in, in, and your your degrees are kind of interesting as well to end up in in aging and and uh, that whole area. So welcome, Nathan, and tell us a little bit more about yourself and fill in some of the holes and places where I left. <laughs> sure, yeah, happy to do that. So uh, I, uh, as was mentioned, so I did a PhD in bioengineering at UC San Diego, and I went from there. Uh, got a faculty position at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign in chemical engineering and at the Institute for Genomic Biology. I actually deferred that. I got that position straight out of grad school, but I deferred it for two years to go do a postdoc with uh, Lee Hood, who I ended up writing the book with. Uh, this was many years ago. And uh, at the Institute for Systems Biology. So I became very interested in uh, personalized medicine at that time. I then went, became an assistant professor at the University of Illinois, was there for four years. Uh, all the time, Lee and I stayed in close contact, and then he uh, just kept reaching out and eventually uh, recruited me back to ISB as an associate professor. I then became associate director of the Institute, worked with Lee uh, closely for a number of years. Uh, we co-founded a company together uh, called Aravail, which was one of the, the first big scientific mm -hmm. wellness company. Uh, we ran, uh -huh. uh, we did that for about uh, five years. It uh, led to a ton of incredible science, uh, but financially, uh, the company ended up not uh, making it, uh, so it it yeah. folded. Uh, but it led to a lot of other things. Uh, so then, uh, Lee and I did a lot of work in scientific wellness, uh, which is what we'll talk about at some point. Uh, and we wrote this book yeah. together uh, from Harvard Press that just came out called "The Age of Scientific Wellness: uh, Why wow. the Future." And is personalized, predictive, data rich, and in your hands. Uh, and we can go through that. And so, mm -hmm. Lee, uh, and for listeners that don't know, Lee Hood is a very famous scientist. He was the uh, inventor of the automated DNA sequencer that made the Human Genome Project oh. possible. He won the National oh. Medal of Science from President Obama and a, a million other things. And mm -hmm. so, uh, we did that uh, together. And we actually merged our lab groups together about five or six years ago and ran a joint enterprise for a while. And then a couple years ago, uh, I got, uh, I was contacted by Paul Jacobson, uh, the CEO of Thorn, uh, who had seen all this work that we've done. And we'll, we'll talk a little more about that. And basically convinced me to shift my career, which I did jumping out of academia, where I, 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 I maintained an on-leave appointment at ISB, but I have moved full-time now to New York and working on uh, the new company, which is Thorn Health Tech, or the new to me, I should say, uh, Thorn yeah, Health Tech. Okay. Uh -huh. So I had moved to become CEO of this startup company called Longevity. We then merged Longevity and Thorn Research together to form Thorn Health Tech. Uh -huh. We IPO that on the NASDAQ about uh, a year and a half ago or so. Wow. And so, and so now that's brought me to my current position, which is as chief scientific officer of Thorn Health Tech. Anyway, that's that's too much information, but okay. there you go. There's uh, more background in that show. Well, you've had, a, you've had a busy, interesting life. That's great. Yeah, sounds like you've done a lot of good work. It's been, it's been fun. Um, yeah, I would say the big animating push that I've been most interested in over the last decade has been this area that we call scientific wellness. And Thorn Health mm. Tech itself is a company that is dedicated to uh, scientific wellness as an as an enterprise. And and okay. what we mean by that um, is to be able to take detailed measurements from a person. So 
so Lee and I had led, um, I think, the largest studies of deep multiomics measurements. So these are just measuring thousands of different variables out of your blood and your stool mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. saliva and, and all of these kind of pieces to generate really deep information about what you can do in your health. Uh, and then with Thorne, what we do is we take that information and we have a gut health test. We have a biological aging test. You know, So we have various okay. tests get access to this kind of information. Then we use AI to analyze that information and provide personalized recommendations to people. So what can you actually do that would make a difference? And mm -hmm. we can get, and in some places in particular, we can get incredibly granular about that. And oh, then wow. the third piece is to be able to provide solutions to people. So these can be uh, you know, lifestyle recommendations uh, and they can also relate to uh, thorn uh, core business around um, nutritional supplements and things like this. Oh, okay. so Horn has an eight, has now expanded up to about an 800,000 square foot facility in South Carolina. And so wow. we make about 300 different products and they're controlled all the way from the plants in the ground to the end. There's four rounds of testing in every one of them. They're used by 47,000 healthcare uh, practitioners and about wow. 5 million customers. So we have a, a big enterprise that's going uh, with a great reputation on the quality side. And so my mm -hmm. coming into that was really about bringing testing AI together with product solutions in ways that oh, we okay. can monitor and improve health and really looking to be a, a preventive health company. Okay, okay, interesting, interesting. So the, do you, in, in all of these supplements and, and the health, areas that you guys are working in is it like a really broad line or are there particular kinds that you that you you know yeah. do more of or concentrate on yeah it's, it's a great question so mm -hmm. thorn came and the early days of thorn it was totally focused on as a as a health practitioner business so we've really okay. done a lot where we've been selling to doctors. In fact, most of our customers initially found out about us from their physician. So that's been historically okay. how that's happened. Uh -huh. In recent times, we've really started to focus primarily as a healthy aging company. And so, you know, okay. campaigns that we're doing right now are really around uh, healthy aging. And so mm. with the broad portfolio, so in the science realm, we always talk about the hallmarks of aging. There's a number of mm. hallmarks of aging right. that you look at, you know, DNA stability, uh, which involves things like telomere lengths, but also the ability to do DNA repair. You might look at senescent cells, mm -hmm. you might look at metabolic capacity, you know, all kinds of, of mm -hmm. features like that. And so mm -hmm. one of the things that is because we have such a broad portfolio, we're able to hit a lot of those mechanisms around the hallmarks of aging. Oh, okay. And it's one of the ways that uh -huh. at least internally, we focus a lot of what we're doing around, all right, well, which hallmarks of aging can we hit? And if we can't hit them, then what might we do from a discovery potential to find out ways that we can add that into the portfolio? So we, we try to be okay. uh, a company that can help people as they try to have a long, healthy life at whatever stage they're at. So that that's really how it's focused. Okay. Okay. And so um, is, is it mostly through doctors or is it in some of the, um, you know, some of the, so in, I hate to call them health stores, but, you know, there's different places that. that so we have, yeah. So we're mostly not in stores um, and we do that um, uh, for a variety of reasons. So the mm -hmm. two big channels we have is either uh, either through doctors uh, or mm -hmm. other healthcare practitioners uh, where mm -hmm. you know we sit in the office or something like that, and then the right. other way way that's actually been growing like crazy over the last few years has been our online uh, direct to consumer. So at oh, thorn.com, okay. and people also you know also will buy it through Amazon or things like that. Okay. Uh, one of the reasons we like it when people come to thorn.com and why we haven't put it in a store is because the online experience lets us do a lot more education around mm. 
what are your health needs, what might be useful to them, what not. So they get right. that if they're working with a provider, then they get that. Uh, and if mm -hmm. they come online, then they get a version of that, uh, especially if they do testing. And we have a set of questionnaires and we have tests. And 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 uh, so if someone wants to say, try to improve their aging, they could take, uh, uh -huh. we've got a biological age test. It's based on 40 different clinical labs. And we do it based wow. on these clinical lab tests rather than, for example, epigenetics or something like that. Because the clinical mm -hmm. labs, one, are the most predictive for uh, health outcomes mm -hmm. in the future. So they tell you they're the strongest for that. And the second mm -hmm. is because they're well understood, we can map different signals into different processes in your body, whether it relates to metabolic oh. health, or liver health, or okay. heart health, or what, whatever, it, whatever it is. And then you can mm -hmm. get personalized recommendations for things that you can do to improve on you can then retest. Uh, Did you in fact get the benefit that, that you were hoping for and that we were aiming for uh -huh. and see if uh -huh. that in fact reduced the biological age on the next test. And so those are the uh -huh. kind of things that people can do. And thorn.com is, is, you know, it's not a, a, pres a prescriptive type, you know, path that everyone takes. Everyone can take their own individual journey, but we make uh -huh. those available for, for individuals to go through. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. And, and, um, who is it that you're, that you're finding is, is coming in and, and using so, your line? Yeah. So we, we have a very broad, uh, set of people who have come through and, do, and done this. Uh, you know, we've had mm -hmm. five, five million customers so far. Uh, wow. that have, so there, there's a lot and it really runs the gamut. Sorry. So one, one thing that Thorne is really uh, well known for is our work with uh, athletes. So we have, a, so we're in the locker room of essentially every professional sports team in the country and a number overseas. Uh, wow. We're the only company that the UFC allows into their ultra performance centers um, because wow. they had, you know, doping and some things like that in the past. And so yeah. they trust Thorne. So we're the only ones allowed uh, in there. Um we have the only A plus rating from the regulatory body in Australia of any supplement company. The reason I bring that up is because in Australia, they regulate supplement companies as pharmaceutical companies. So you have to go through, you know, not just, you know, the, the yeah. quality controls that you do here, but you actually have to show efficacy trials and, and all of those things. And we're the only company that has gotten that rating. So, wow. so those are all pieces that, that, that matter. So we have, so we have a high end sports business that comes in and then we have a lot of people that come in that just want to focus on their health. Mm -hmm. A lot of times they're triggered because they have some issue, for example, our mm -hmm. gut health test, which is a microbiome test. Okay. Some people do it because they're just biohackers and they like to get information. A lot of people will do it because they're having some issue with their gut, constipation uh -huh. or diarrhea or irritable bowel syndrome or or whatever it is. And so uh -huh. a lot of people will come in because they have a an issue or a problem. And and so uh -huh. there's there's all kinds of questionnaires and things on thorn.com where people can click in and just say, you know, here's my issue. This is what I'm looking for. And uh -huh. then they can find something and they can research it. And we also have articles that go through. Uh, you know, a whole variety of, of, of health information. And then mm -hmm. we also slide back to the original scientific literature. So if you want to go back and find, okay, well, why, why do we believe that, that this, you know, compound is important for this? Okay. Uh, we keep uh, quite extensive libraries of, of that kind of information. And so people can dive in and depending on how uh -huh. they're at and they can just, you know, trust and go, or they can dive in and read a whole bunch of papers and, and validate uh -huh. them. They're uh, sophisticated that way. So there's all kinds of things that they can do. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, that sounds like one of those places I would probably be on for like five days. My husband have to come <laughs> find me or something. <laughs> I know it and all that stuff too. <laughs> yeah, otherwise I wouldn't be doing this podcast, believe me. <laughs> of course, of course. So, um, well, that that's really interesting. I I know I've come across Thorn. I was just looking, but you guys don't, you don't. No, that's something else. Okay, I sworn at some point I got some, did get something from you guys, but I don't know, I don't remember what it was. 
Yeah, good. Could very well be. And one of the other things we've really focused a lot on at Thorn, uh, especially on mm -hmm. the testing side, is we're trying to make the testing as easy as possible for people to implement. So for example, the gut health test. So the microbiome is really important. And it turns out the microbiome is super important in aging. Uh, my lab, we published a, a study a couple of years ago now in uh, Nature Metabolism, which is one of the big um, mm -hmm. journals, but that basically showed that if you stay healthy over the age of 50, so this basically starts at age 50, if you stay healthy, your microbiome starts looking less and less like anyone else's microbiome. So it becomes more and more unique huh. to you a uh, decade wow. over decade. Now, if you get uh -huh. on a bunch of drugs, it goes away. If you are hospitalized, it goes away. But if uh -huh. you don't, if you stay relatively healthy, your microbiome will be on a trajectory with you and it will look less and less like anyone else's. And one of the interesting things that came out of that is that when we looked at that as a signal, in an elderly mm -hmm. population of people over the age of 80, so 80 up to about 100, mm -hmm. it turned out that the uniqueness of the microbiome was predictive of how long uh, the person was likely to live after that age. So it was differential. Wow. Uh -huh. and, and it segmented really strongly as well on things like, you know, higher micro, you had a more unique microbiome if you were able to walk fast average over the age of uh of 80 in this case versus less. Mm -hmm. uh, if you were, um, if your overall health was rated as excellent as opposed to, you know, low or poor, uh, mm -hmm. those kind of things. So you just, we saw this signal uh, over and over again. Anyway, coming back to, back to my main point. Oh, so okay. yeah. for aging, but one of the problems is that not many, not many people will take a microbiome test comparatively across the whole population. And the reason for that uh, traditionally has been the steps that you have to take. And it's not that big a deal, but it's a big enough deal. And, and what it is, is that most of the tests, uh, what you have to do is you have to poop in a bucket or on a piece of paper or something, whatever mm -hmm. comes in the kit. And then you've got to take a little scoop. You've got to scoop it up, put it mm -hmm. into a vial, close it. Some of the tests require freezing. Mm. I imagine your listeners probably don't have a sample fridge, so that's going next to your food. Sometimes people don't, you know, don't love that. Um, so there's all these barriers to people getting what's super valuable health information. And so what we did at Thorn was we just sat around and thought, well, what's the easiest way we could possibly get a stool sample from somebody? And we came up with this idea that we call the microbiome wipe, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's basically... Okay special toilet paper. Uh, it's made out yeah. of a polymer. And so what happens if you get the test, then you wipe like you do every day of your life. So it doesn't, you know, it's not real behavior change there, but then you uh -huh. take that, drop it into a vial, uh, tighten okay. it. And then once it's closed tightly, then you can shake it and the wipe will dissolve away in about 10 seconds and release a salt solution into the into there that will preserve the DNA. And we showed that that worked. We published it in the wow. peer reviewed literature in Frontiers in Immunology last year. Mm -hmm. And then you send the sample and you get your results. And that will tell you if you have uh, pathogens, so disease causing bacteria in there, you can monitor probiotics. So if you're taking a probiotic, but you're curious if it's working for you, this will tell yeah. you. Uh, if you huh. are looking at uh, gut permeability, so so-called leaky gut, or you're having problems mm -hmm. with digestion, uh, it mm -hmm. will tell you whether or not the species of microbiome of, in the microbiome are making too much ammonia, for example. So if they make too much oh. ammonia, it makes your stomach too basic. And so uh, you're not, it's not acidic enough. And so uh -huh. that will cause problems with your digestion. And you can see if your microbiome is causing that, uh, uh -huh. et cetera, et cetera. Go on for a long time. Yeah. There's many, many things that you can learn by looking at a microbiome. And the science oh, sure. just drives new discoveries on that every every week, pretty much, you learn something new about the microbiome. Yeah, 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 no, exactly, exactly. So is there, is there some reason, I mean, so many of us now, we've gotten used to having to put the little, the little thing into this, your poop while you, right, and send yeah. it back. Not yeah, and poop, some of us, stick, we just do it. Right? <laughs> yes, of course. 
<laughs> well, I don't know. The only reason it came to mind is because I just, it was that time of year, you know, the, the doctor sends it out and. Oh yeah. Yeah. Right. And exactly. send it back. Yeah. Exactly. So we are hopeful that we could use the wipe in a whole bunch of different uh, technologies like that within the medical system, because we just think it's a much easier experience for people. Anecdotally, uh -huh. it was yeah. interesting. Uh, Sarah Gottfried, I don't know if you know her, but she's a four time, uh -huh. yeah. four times best selling author, uh, uh, friend, uh, great doctor, just uh, fa uh -huh. fabulous. Uh, but she was on uh, the Huberman Lab podcast a little while ago, and she shared a story that said that, um, anyway, she's working with an NBA team, but they would never do the, the microbiome test. And she was a little frustrated with that, but she switched to Thorne's test once we had the wipe and shared that, yeah, that they were fine with it, that they would all set, that they would do it. And so there'll be a, a, a study coming out on that at some point, I believe. Uh, and so it's, uh, so it's interesting. So, so we just try to lower those barriers. We're also working yeah. on, well, we have a device that actually won MedTech's um, medical device product of the year a couple, a uh, couple of weeks ago. It's mm, uh, wow. called, called the one draw, which allows for a virtually painless uh, at home blood measurement, uh, uh, a blood collection. And mm -hmm. essentially it's a, a Lancet device and it enables uh, you to get about 150 microliters of blood. So a small amount, but enough mm -hmm. to make measurements on thousands of metabolites or proteins or a few clinical labs and things of that nature. And so, and, and we've done this now on tens of thousands of people. It's, it's uh, FDA cleared wow. for supervised draw in the United States. We're hoping for D2C soon. And it's already cleared D to C in a number of other countries around the world. So we've already done it on tens of thousands mm -hmm. of people uh, with a 99.9% repeat reported uh, ability for people to get the blood done properly at home. Uh, that was mm -hmm. published by the University of Cambridge, not us, a big study that they did. Wow. The and so anyway, that's another example. So we're trying to take a uh -huh. lot of these, got to go into a doctor's office or go into a phlebotomist and turn it into something that you can do virtually painlessly at yeah. home on a scale of up to 10, uh, you know, the 12,000 people that took, uh, took the survey rated it between a zero and one on, on this, on a pain scale. So it's, it's very wow. easy I've done it myself a number of times, Uh huh. easy to do. And so, so those are, those are the kind of things we're really focused on because yeah, you can go through and there's lots of good general advice. And as you know, people that listen to your podcast are going to be familiar with, on all these kind of things that you should do as you get older. Right. But there's also this, you know, we call that sort of general wellness. And this notion of what we call scientific wellness, like uh, that we talk about in the book, for example, you can add a layer onto that now where you're looking at very precise measurements from your own body and identifying, are there th things that might not be apparent to you externally that will make a big difference in your health, such as optimizing your gut microbiome, such as optimizing you know, your blood chemistry, looking for right. things that develop into problems downstream that you can nudge in, in, in important ways early to try to shift a trajectory towards uh, away, you know, away from disease mm -hmm. or its maintenance of wellness. Yeah. 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 No, and that, that makes a lot of sense because there's so many things that people do and they think, oh, you know, it's not hurting me and this is fine and this food I'm eating or whatever. And, you know, we're all so personal how our yeah, bodies and, are. <laughs> it's absolutely true. And I can give a couple of examples. So one that's that that may be familiar is just the notion that, for example, eating fish in general, very good for you. Right? You get high omega-3s. Uh, good protein source, all those kind of things, mm -hmm. but you might have mercury in the fish. And so if you're yeah. monitoring yourself, you That's would identify. Yeah. So if you're having tuna sushi and we had this, so this study that we ran called the pioneer 100 that we then expanded to about 5,000 people over about four years. And we did wow. massive number of measures. So genome, proteome, metabolism, thousands of measurements on all these people tracking what mm -hmm. happened in health and disease. And, and we saw that in a number of people where they had really high levels of mercury. So they're on a path to getting you know, negative effects from mercury poisoning. 
because they were doing things like eating tuna sushi three times a week, which they think of as being healthy and good. And on average it is, but tuna sit pretty high up in the food chain. So they accumulate heavy metals from all of the fish that they eat. And they're, and they're so big that they keep it in themselves too. They're big and they keep it in them. And so, so it becomes, yeah. a problem. but if you're monitoring, you'll know that a more specific example, um, let's say, uh, if you're looking at cardiovascular disease, so a risk factor mm -hmm. for cardiovascular disease is a molecule uh, called TMAO. So, mm -hmm. so one of the molecules that turns out to be really important for brain health as you age is phosphatidylcholine. Uh, and we can mm -hmm. talk more about that, but, but phosphatidylcholine uh, becomes a rate limiting uh, nutrient as you're trying to generate oxygen, I'm sorry, as you're trying to generate energy in your brain under low mm -hmm. oxygen. And as you get older, okay. the ability to perfuse oxygen in your brain goes down. And so it becomes more acute as you get older. But, uh, and so if you look in the nutrition literature, for example, uh, people who eat diets rich in phosphatidylcholine, which you can find in eggs or you can supplement or, or whatever, mm -hmm. but people who eat diets rich in phosphatidylcholine get Alzheimer's about three years later than those who don't. And so, okay. so phosphatidylcholine, we would say is a very important molecule. And we've actually done a huge amount of work on, on Alzheimer's and different uh, reasons that we, we believe mm. in that. But if you have the wrong species in your microbiome, it, they will eat phosphatidylcholine and they will turn yeah. it into trimethylamine, which your liver will turn into TMAO. So, so this is where a personalized approach has become really powerful because if you check your microbiome, then yeah, you should take, and I take phosphatidylcholine every day because I think it's going to be good for my brain longevity, but you know, so you can do that. But I also check my microbiome periodically because if you get the wrong species in there, it will start eating that and turning it into something that's instead bad for your heart. And so there's all this subtlety that is that for the most part, uh, we're blind to, right? We never think about it. We don't do it. You say, okay, you do these general things that are healthy and you'll generally come out well. And at a macroscopic level, that's true. But since each of us only have one life and you don't want to, you don't want to be the exception of the rule. And we all know that person, you know, thinking of, you know, someone close at the moment, you know, that is incredibly active, does everything right in health. The person I'm thinking of actually bikes everywhere, super healthy, uh, mm -hmm. food choices, vegan, you know, doesn't own a car so that they literally just get in shape all the time, uh, active mountains, hiking, has a horrible form of cancer. You know, we didn't know it was coming. And so, you know, there's all these examples where mm -hmm. there are these really specific things that we want to be monitoring for or watching to augment our general wellness, but also to try to identify what might be hidden issues that we can mm. leave. And yeah. the other thing I would say, and just in terms of, you know, thinking about prevention and optimizing your healthy journey through life is, you know, coming back to Alzheimer's, for example, if you wait until you have cognitive decline, that means a bunch of your neurons have already died. And mm -hmm. once your neurons are dying and once they're dead, nobody mm -hmm. knows how to put those back together. And the whole notion that there's going to be a drug that will reverse Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. No chance, no chance because no, don't, don't hold your breath. <laughs> just think about it. What is the chance that there's a mechanism? And I'm not saying you couldn't mm -hmm. help, right? You, you could definitely help. Yeah, but, stall oh, it maybe, but yeah. Maybe. Yeah. But the but there's no chance that a that giving a small molecule is going to regrow the neurons and synapses that you lost, mm -hmm. right? Or at least the brain would have to do something pretty miraculous on its own, right? You'd have to you'd have to hit something that's pretty hard to imagine. But prevention, which is not allowing those cells to die and keeping them alive, and being focused on what happens as you're getting closer to that is very doable. That's a much, much simpler, it's the story of Humpty Dumpty, right? We all know this since we were three years old. Like, yeah. Once it's gone, building it back is hard, but keeping it is very doable. 
And one of the things that people you know, probably don't think about so much is the energetic needs that your brain has. So your brain consumes 20% of your body's energy and it's 2% of your body's biomass. So on average, it's 10 times more metabolically active. So that's why if you're working on something really hard, you'll often get the munchies, right? You want to eat, eat, eat. And some of that can be just, you know, nervous things that maybe you want to get rid of. But part of it is that you are consuming a significant amount of energy, right? Your brain's, your brain's churning uh -huh. along. And uh -huh. as you get older, your ability to, to perfuse oxygen into your brain through your blood vessels, it gets worse, measurably so. And this, these have all been done in studies. So we, we have models mm. of... Mm -hmm. Taken from those papers, just in, on how it falls down, uh -huh. not evenly distributed into the brain. So what this means is that as you get older, there are certain parts of your brain where it's it's lower oxygen, or what we'd call hypoxic, but it's 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 lower oxygen, and it gets harder for the brain to keep making enough energy in those hypoxic regions, those lower oxygen regions, and so as that happens. Uh, then it gets amplified by uh, problems in cholesterol transports, what APOE, the big Alzheimer's gene, is involved in. And it turns out that if all you do is look at the lowering of your ability to perfuse oxygen, and then the differences between the cholesterol trafficking of keeping cholesterol and astrocytes low, that APOE4 is slow at it, which gives you Alzheimer's early. APOE2 is fast at it, which protects you from Alzheimer's. You can do a, we've done this, a quantitative simulation of 10 million patients. And that those two facts alone will predict the age of onset of dementia across all the different genotypes. And so we think that's a really fundamental mechanism across, you know, a lot of Alzheimer's disease. And so there's all these things that you can get into, but as soon as you start thinking of Alzheimer's a little more as an energetic issue and not just about amyloid plaques, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. all of a sudden, a bunch of things around prevention makes sense. So mm -hmm. if you're thinking about exercise, right? Exercise is protective to Alzheimer's and dementia. And mm -hmm. so, you know, it won't protect you forever, but it makes, makes a difference. And, mm -hmm. and as soon as you start thinking about energetics, it totally makes sense because it keeps the oxygen perfusion in your brain higher. Your slope of decline mm -hmm. as you're getting older is lessened. And then there's dietary things. I mentioned phosphatidylcholine. So you can look at mm -hmm. well, what are the nutrient needs as your brain, as certain regions of your brain become lower oxygen, when you solve, and this is what my PhD is on, by the way, is modeling metabolism. So, yeah, so uh -huh. as you as you build models of, meta, of, of the metabolic needs, you can uh -huh. see that they shift as you get into these um, lower, into the state that makes it harder to maintain that energy. Okay. So then the diet, you know, so that's why we, and so when we ran the simulation, that's when we saw that it predicted that phosphatidylcholine would become rate limiting. You run, so in the simulations, you run out of it when you simulate metabolism. Uh, that's when okay. we went into the nutrition literature and said, as just a sanity check, do people eat phosphatidylcholine get Alzheimer's later? And the answer is, yeah, three years later. Right. And so, uh -huh. we said, okay, well, that that comports with what the model was telling us when it said, yeah, you're going to become rate limiting to this. And then we're just simulating the biochemistry there. And uh -huh. so as you go through all these things, it just starts to give you some view of the, of actions you can take towards prevention. And you do it by starting from an aspect of studying wellness. So this is what we call scientific wellness, but studying how does the brain okay. stay alive? What are the right. constraints? it has to solve what does it have to do every day every second of every day for you to stay you know doing with with your cognition mm -hmm. and so those are the pieces that i think become so important because one of the things that drove me nuts for many years was that in the public press you would always hear don't go get your genome done because they're going to tell you that you're at high risk for alzheimer's and there's nothing you can do and that was repeated thousands and thousands and thousands of times. <laughs> and, but that's not true. What is mm -hmm. true is that there is no drug to treat Alzheimer's effectively. That is what that meant. But our right. whole medical system is so geared towards 
diagnosis, take this drug, diagnose drug, and it's a huge money engine. Uh, yeah. But we repeat that too often because yes, there is no cure for Alzheimer's a hundred percent. You know, we don't know how to, like I said, once those neurons are dead, we don't know how to put them back together. Mm -hmm. There's all kinds of things you can do to push that off into the future. Mm -hmm. In fact, we're going to launch a, a brain health test in the not too distant future from Thorne that will have these uh, digital twin models behind them uh, that will wow. provide a personalized path towards uh -huh. making your brain's health for as long as possible. We're going to try to give people a really personalized view of that uh, based on you know their own biology and this really uh -huh. model that uh, provides a, a trajectory of predicted cognition throughout mm -hmm. Throughout life and how it changes based on different interventions or different things that you might choose to do. So that I'm, I'm super. Wow. And when is, and when is that coming out? <laughs> I need that. <laughs> as soon as I can possibly do it. We have it. We have an awesome demo of it with, you know, so we, we've got it working. We're just productizing it. So it, it works. We've got, ah. we've got the pieces all built. We've spent the last two and a half uh -huh. years doing it. Um, yeah. I'm hoping it's going to be out in six months or so, but I will. Just yeah, the, well, I, I will, I, can I get on the can I get on the mailing list or <laughs> you, definitely, definitely. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I'm not kidding. <laughs> well, yeah, no, that sounds that sounds incredible. That sounds incredible. Um well, I shouldn't say that. That sounds wonderful. Let's put it that way. Not incredible. <laughs> I'm not trying to question it at all. <laughs> Oh, no, not, oh. not at all. And you should. And, and, yeah. and people listening, you know, when they see it, they should. And, you know, we're going to be running oh, tests oh. and trials on it continuously and all those things. But and we have been for for a while and comparing it against yeah. against data. And, yeah, we'll we'll put this, uh, you know, we'll put all that all that evidence out for people to evaluate for themselves. But it has really made yeah. a huge. And, and just as a background, I wasn't NIH funded Alzheimer's researcher for 10 years before coming into, into Thorn. Um, and, and I would say during that period, I just had no clue of the big picture of Alzheimer's disease. We did all kinds of interesting papers and studies and, you know, I'm, I'm mm. proud of the work we did, but mm. big picture, I just couldn't see it until we put together the, this detailed like model, trying to model how the brain stayed alive and, mm -hmm. and as we looked at this from the standpoint of digital twins and working with a, a great a friend and colleague, uh, Tom Patterson, uh, she, uh, mm -hmm. on this, that uh, we teamed up on this uh, about two and a half years ago. And oh, okay. it has totally, it's just totally, we, with this, I just feel like we now have a, a fairly comprehensive view and mm -hmm. And a, and a uh, framework on which to hang lots of different detail and different studies. We've, we use data uh, and insights from about 950 papers uh, that are all indexed uh, wow. under the model. And we've compared it against over 30 human research studies and clinical trials, and it reproduces the data there really well. And wow. to get it to gold standard level, we'll, we'll have to do, you know, some prospective clinical trials with patients and and do mm -hmm. personalized predictions and show. And you know, so there, there is mm -hmm. still work to be done. And I'm sure we're missing all kinds of pieces. All models are, are approximations, but I just yeah. don't feel like we're flying blind the way I felt like a few years ago. Uh, and time will tell, okay. and we'll, we'll get this out into the public domain and you know have uh, people do it. I have showed it to a lot of experts so far and gotten quite positive responses, but we've done those in, in you know, bits and pieces we haven't yet. Uh -huh. uh, figured out the venue to just release it out in the world, but we'll, we'll do that soon. Okay. Well, that sounds very exciting. For yeah. Sure. Very exciting. Yeah. Wow. Well, I guess we should, you, you have to, you have to, uh, you know, another appointment. So <laughs> <laughs> we should probably wrap up here and um, thank you very much for coming on. And I will say that, um, which I have to say that neither of us are medical doctors. None of this is medical advice. And if you are having any problems, please go and see your medical doctor. And 
get started to find out what your problem is. And with that, thank you very much. And I will see everybody next week.